Bonne journée, joyeuse journée internationale de l'anesthésie. Feliz Dia Mondial de l'anesthésie. It's my pleasure to welcome you to this fourth webinar in our series for the WFSA annual theme of workforce wellbeing. We began the year with a webinar on individual and organizational wellbeing strategies. Then the Quality and Safety Committee presented our second webinar about strategies to combat fatigue and the hashtag Fight Fatigue campaign. Our third webinar was presented by the Diversity, Equity and Inclusion Committee about the ageing anaesthetist. Tonight we will hear, or today we will hear, from our three speakers about the work of advocacy, collaboration, education and mentoring, including wisdom about how mentoring is done. Thank you to all our speakers, our translators, and to you, the audience, for attending. We will now hear a short message from our president, Professor Daniela Filipescu. Thank you, Professor Filipescu. Dear colleagues, I'm delighted to address you on this special World Anesthesia Day webinar focused on the workforce well-being and supporting the mental, emotional, and physical health of anesthesia professionals around the world. This year's World Anesthesia Day builds on the continued success and impact of the WFSA annual theme and highlights the importance of workforce well-being. The well-being of the anesthesia workforce is vital for ensuring patient safety and enhancing health outcome in the communities we serve. However, the demand of long hours, high stress, and the critical nature of our work can lead to burnout and other well-being challenges. We must look to bolster the well-being of those who dedicate themselves to patient care and create an environment for achieving satisfaction that enables the professionals to thrive and fully realize their potential for the benefit of the patients, themselves, and health system. There is an urgent and ongoing need to ensure that those who care for patients are themselves cared for. Supporting the well-being of anesthesia workforce is an investment in the future of healthcare around the world, a prerequisite in achieving the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals to transform our world and universal health coverage. Workforce well-being is not just a personal matter. It is essential to delivering high-quality patient care. When healthcare professionals are supported, empowered, and protected, they are better equipped to provide safe, effective care to their patients. The annual theme, along with World Anesthesia Day, is bringing much needed attention to the challenges anesthesia providers like you and me face and the solutions needed to safeguard their mental and physical health. To date, more than 1,000 clinicians have registered for well-being webinars held throughout the year. A further 3,000 have watched the recordings of these webinars on our YouTube channel. This level of engagement highlights the critical importance of supporting the health and resilience of anesthesia providers. In the next few months, we'll be publishing a special volume of update in anesthesia which will focus on different areas of workforce well-being. I encourage you to visit the WFSA website or our social media to find out about other World Anesthesia Day activities and resources. The WFSA remains dedicated to championing workforce well-being as a fundamental pillar of our mission, ensuring the best care for patients throughout a healthy and resilient anesthesia workforce. On behalf of the WFSA, I extend my deepest gratitude to all anesthesia professionals' commitment to their patients. I wish you all a very happy World Anesthesia Day. Thank you very much, Professor Filipescu.
I'd like to remind everyone that at the end of our webinar, there will be a question and answer session. Our first speaker tonight is Dr. Mary Nabukenya, who is a paediatric anesthesiologist at Malagu National Referral Hospital, Uganda, a lecturer at the Makariri University College of Health Sciences and Vice President and President-Elect of the Association of Anesthesiologists of Uganda. Dr. Nabukenya spoke so eloquently about this topic at the recent All Africa Congress that I asked her to present here. Thank you, Dr. Nabu Kenya. Thank you very much for inviting me to speak um, today on the World Anesthesia Day. Uh, good evening, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's such a privilege to be speaking to you today um, on the World Anesthesia Day. And my topic is going to be on anesthesia workforce well-being in Africa. And I have no disclosures of relevance today. And I'll go through my talk uh, using this outline. Burnout has had a name since the 1970s due to the work of Herbert Frudenberger. And unfortunately for most of us, if not all of us, we've probably been um, accosted by headlines such as these. And it's always sad and jolting, but I never was so jolted by these headlines until it happened to two anesthesiologists that I know personally. Burnout has such a significant impact um, on healthcare providers' lives, and it affects us both mentally and physically. And we then get predisposed to substance abuse, broken relationships, and suicide, as we see in the news sometimes. Unfortunately, not only do the healthcare providers suffer, so do our patients. And research has shown that patients that are cared for by providers that are burnt out have lower satisfaction levels, they have longer recovery times, and unfortunately, they have higher incidences of medical errors. And the problem is such that not one uh, specific kind of uh, cadre is going to be affected. All of us are affected. Unfortunately, training at risk. And the incidence um, varies from 10 to 59. Uh, they, there are a few African studies uh, from which the incidence is about 17 to 52%. That is pretty high, and the general public. Many risk factors have been forwarded, um, but when you look at the, the work that has been put out from Africa, these are some of the factors that have been raised. Uh, short duration of uh, some of the other challenges that we face in, in Africa, uh, our patients have poor outcomes. The African Surgical Outcomes Study uh, showed us a number of things. An African adult is two times as likely to die. Uh, one in 50 women die after a C-section. 11 times uh, more likely for an African child to die after they've had surgery. Unfortunately, the infrastructure and the equipment that we need um, for us to try and do a good job is inadequate. Uh, you don't even have uh, support structures like laboratory services or blood bank uh, services. The case burden is such that um, you're faced with a lot of emergencies, a lot of advanced disease, and there is a lot of cesarean deliveries. There's a lack of recognition and appreciation, appreciate us enough. And then of course, the remuneration is poor. Uh, you want to live a decent life, you want to buy a good car. Send your child to a good school, extra shifts. 
uh, only this is adding to the already full plate that you have. But what can we do about it? We've probably all been guilty of neglecting ourselves. Um, Mary, in the be the good. We have to be mindful. Yeah, your connection is a bit unstable. Could you please turn off your camera and just keep the sound? Yeah. All right. Thank you. All right. Unfortunately, as physicians, uh, we usually wait too long before we seek help. Um, we also find it hard to play the patient role and so sometimes we find it hard to accept treatment. Um, unfortunately, we end up suffering long uh, and unnecessarily. So we need to remember to accept our vulnerability and prioritize our mental health. So for individuals, and this has probably been tackled in the past webinars, we have to be self-aware uh, and recognize when we need help and seek that help. Um, and go through uh, a few of these things. Exercise, mindfulness, they've been shown uh, to be things and that we can use um, to, to tackle burnout. And all this uh, to search for the holy grail that is work-life balance. What can organizations do uh, to help? In Africa, as we've said, we have to figure out a way um, for ourselves as individuals. We need to educate ourselves about burnout uh, and find preventive strategies to help us um, be more resilient in our workspaces despite our work pressures. But we also need to find innovative ways uh, to solve the numbers problem. And one of the solutions that we can go to is the partnerships that are out there, partnerships that we can use. The WFSA has provided multiple avenues for training individuals, especially where there is none or too few teachers. And this they do through fellowship training programs, uh, as well as short courses like the SAFE courses. I will talk a little bit more about the SAFE courses. Um, the other thing that we can Explore is training through colleges. For example, the College of Anesthesiologists of East, Central, and Southern Africa, as well as the West African College of Surgeons. Training through these colleges has the potential to increase the training positions if compared to training through universities. However, we have to be cautious not to compromise quality in a bid to increase numbers. We need to appreciate the fact that, yes, we need. We need more physician anesthesia providers, but the problem of Africa is such that our non-physician anesthesia colleagues uh, are playing such a tremendous role and they're going to be with us for so long. And so I think what we need to do is to standardize their training. A little bit more about the SAFE courses and the role that they've played, uh, particularly um, Maybe we didn't think about it that way, but they have when you think about it. For one, um, they were created as refreshers for the most common patients in Sub-Saharan Africa, and that's the obstetric patient and children. By empowering the providers, many of them uh, don't have an opportunity for CME. When they go to a safe course, this is a great opportunity for them to to be equipped with knowledge and skill. And so this empowers them to then go back and do something and feel more empowered to provide care to their patients. But also on these courses, providers um, interact with colleagues from, from different walks of life, different workplaces, get contacts that you know, they can call the next time they're in a crisis. A lot of African leaders today have been groomed on safe courses through the safety OT training and the faculty mentorship that happens during safe courses. But in addition, in addition to that, safe courses were a big, um, a big part of trying to 
to bridge the oximetry gap in, in Africa, especially in the early days when uh, the courses were run alongside a pulse oximetry course. And so by equipping providers with a tool that they can use, they were then able to advocate for better equipment and more equipment because now their workplaces knew the importance of this equipment. A little bit more on education. Um, working in low resource settings, simulation training is one of the things that we need to embrace because it's a vital tool for training, especially because it provides a safe learning environment that allows uh, trainees and, and practitioners to make errors, but in a safe environment. They don't have to go home with the stress that they, they did something terrible and the patient was harmed. You may worry that uh, you need a lot of money to buy the kit for simulation, but not quite. Um, it is such that it allows for customization and you can actually achieve high realism with low technology. Unfortunately, there are many programs out there uh, that you can take up and use to run uh, some simulation courses. I want to highlight that there are some tools that simulation training provides and that have been shown um, to be one of the ways that we can reduce burnout and promote provider well-being. And one of these is giving feedback. This is a major component of simulation training. And so by training providers on how to give feedback, this is a skill and tool that they can use going forward. The other thing is crisis resource management. Uh, courses like the managing emergencies in pediatric anesthesia is very big on crisis resource management. And if you think about the kind of work that we do, these are tools that are priceless for us. And so as an anesthesia provider, this, this, this is, um, this is uh, something that we need and that can help us in our everyday work. The other tool or the other opportunity that we have uh, that can help us solve uh, the burden that we have as working in Africa is collaboration. And this is a picture that um, shows part of a slowly growing community of pediatric anesthesiologists in Africa. But how did this happen? Over a few years, maybe two years ago, it was just a handful of people. <clears throat> and this happened um, through a collaboration of organizations and leveraging a collaboration that was already existence, in existence with the University of Nairobi Pediatric Anesthesia Fellowship Program. The Pediatric Anesthesia Training in Africa Program was created and this has added three more pediatric anesthesia fellowship training sites on the continent. And so to date, there are five, where before it was just two for the entire continent. Collaboration takes many shapes and sizes. Um, and where there are few providers, you have to look for solutions somewhere. One of those solutions can be found um, in international partners, and that is the Zambia Anesthesia Development Program, which was created um, as a partnership between the UK and Zambia. And what it does really is to help build capacity among physician anesthetists in Zambia. Research is another area where, where we need help in Africa and there are collaborations out there, there are partnerships out there that uh, are in existence. I just highlight the University of California, San Francisco Center for Health Equity in Surgery and Anesthesia one. They have multiple fellowship and visiting scholar pathways, which are open to anyone from any walk of life. And you can apply for these, they could launch uh, your research career. Workplace culture is, another place um, where as, as providers in Africa, we can go to to try and improve uh, physician well-being. So as leaders, if you're in a position of leadership, you need to create a space that is safe 
and kind and compassionate for the providers that are working in that space. And part of that involves being considerate during uh, while making schedules. Uh, think about you know the shifts that you give people. They shouldn't be back to back. People shouldn't have to do so many night calls um, on subsequent days. And then if a, if a worker is not taking the breaks that they need, um, I think it needs to be factored into that. I highlight trainees here because they're at particular risk for burnout and we have to be mindful um, of them. In our institutions that we work um, do play a big role, but for many, for many of us, this is something that we need to advocate uh, with our institutions because it's not very well appreciated. Yesterday's pediatric anesthesia article of the day was on a young doctor's final words and what they offer on mental health uh, for others. If you haven't read it, I would recommend that you go and have a look at it. But my takeaway from it was that we need to destigmatize mental health so that healthcare providers, so that our colleagues, so that we can seek help uh, and the support that we need and not fear that it's going to affect our careers. The policies in the institutions where we work need to be mindful of the fact that we have unique challenges that may not, uh, that may not support the things that we need to do. Uh, we need to encourage and push for flexibility. For example, if, a, if a, one of our colleagues is burnt out and cannot do clinical work, there are other ways that they can contribute. For example, let them you know, be involved el elsewhere. They can teach outside the clinical space. They can be involved in research. And then we need to recognize people's contributions outside of traditional roles and to push for and advocate for broader investment in anesthesia and surgery. The sense of community is important and part of that, of where to find that community can be through our professional associations. The WFSA has been a great leader in advocating for provider well-being, uh, not just this year, but even before. Uh, several other national societies have also done this, uh, but majority of African societies do not have a wellness committee. Uh, the Kenya Society has something called uh, a welfare committee that takes care of their members' welfare, and the Egyptian Society does some welfare activities and things that they can do together. However, I highlight the South African Society of Anesthesiologists because they have such a rich um, wellness resource center on their website, including a call, a, hot, a hotline that one can call. Um, the other thing that has been shown to be, um, to be useful uh, in, in fighting burnout and promoting provider well-being is peer support groups, as well as mentorship programs. And we will hear more about the WFSA mentorship program. We need to be advocates. As I said, we're too few on the continent. We're not enough to make an impact. Uh, we can't make enough noise. So every one of us in our little spheres, in our little areas has to be an advocate. For, for ourselves as individuals, we have to advocate for our specialty, but we also have to advocate uh, for our well-being. We are too few and we need to jealously guard uh, the little workforce that we have. So we need to get involved in, in healthcare policies. We need to get involved in activities that are going to affect uh, our workspaces and our lives in one way or another. Um, I'd like to share this. Uh, the Association of Anesthesiologists of Uganda over the past week to commemorate um, this day, we have been engaging in various um, wellness activities. Uh, so I just wanted to share this with you. Thank you very much for listening to me.
Thank you very much, Mary. That was a very thought-provoking talk and I appreciate you giving it again to us today. Thank you. Our next speaker is Professor Stanton Shernan, who's the Director of Cardiac Anesthesia at Brigham and Women's Hospital and a Professor of Anesthesia at Harvard Medical School. His research interests include myocardial ischemia reperfusion injury, systemic inflammation, perioperative genomics, and perioperative echocardiography, as well as mentoring. Professor Shernan will deliver his presentation as a video again because of the value of this presentation at the All Africa Congress, and hopefully he will be available during question time at the end. Thank you, Professor Shernan. Hello, everyone. It's a great pleasure to chat with you about mentorship and academic medicine on World Anesthesia Day on behalf of the WFSA. Here are my objectives. I want to disclose to you that I was never fortunate to actually have an academic mentor. Let's begin by discussing the definition of a mentor, at least according to Merriam-Webster's dictionary, which states that a mentor is a trusted counselor or guide, someone who helps you with your career, specific work projects, or provides general life advice out of the goodness of his or her heart. I would ask you to think about if you consider yourself a mentor. And while you're thinking about it, I would suggest the following, that mentors are not self-defined. Mentors are defined and chosen by others. From a historical perspective, it's somewhat interesting that when we think of mentors, they tend to be older male figures exhibiting greater wisdom. There is the biblical figure Moses, who might be considered a mentor. In folklore, we have the wizard Merlin, who taught King Arthur and gave him the knowledge and wisdom to rule England. And in Greek mythology, there actually is a mentor. If we think about Homer's epic, The Odyssey, Odysseus was fighting and journeying for 20 years. Telemachus, his son, grew up under the supervision of mentor, an old and trusted friend. On a personal level, we might think of our own mentors throughout life as perhaps a teacher, an athletic coach, a business partner, a physician or professor, a clergy man or woman, or if you're really fortunate, you would consider a parent one of your mentors. Regardless of the type of mentor, they all seem to share the same characteristics of wisdom, experience, spirituality, they're highly respected, patient, admirable, compassionate, iconic, and perhaps most importantly, self-sacrificing. So when we put this all together, I would broaden the definition of mentor and consider that it is someone who sees more potential, talent, and ability in you than you see in yourself and enables you to become the best you can be. And thinking about mentors a little bit more in depth, I think it's also important to consider that mentorship is a two-way street, a dyadic relationship between humans, not simply a transaction. It's critically important that mentor, mentees should not just march up to people and ask them to advise them. They actually need to take the time to develop genuine connections with those they admire and assist their mentors whenever they can. There are actually different types of mentors that you might encounter throughout your life. The first is often called the master of craft or the Jedi master. If you know you want to be the best in your field, ask who are the most iconic figures in that area and do your best to contact them. These masters of craft are someone who has accumulated their wisdom through years of experience, who can provide insight into your industry and fine tune your skills, and they should help you realize and hone your strength towards the closest state of perfection as possible within your area of expertise. They help you to become the best you can be. The second type of mentor is the champion of your cause, someone who will talk you up to others, ideally your sponsor who's always thinking about you in the background. They advocate who, advocates for who have your back. They're networking facilitators within your field of expertise. The third type of mentor is the co-pilot. They could be colleagues who talk you through projects, advise you in navigating the personalities in your company, and even listen to you vent over a simple cup of coffee. It's best for this relationship when it's equally reciprocal, committing to, collaborating with, 
and holding each other accountable. They're essentially your best friend. Then we have the anchor, number four. These folks don't even have to work in your industry. They can be a friend or a family member, and they differ from the champion men mentor who supports you to achieve specific career goals, while the anchor is a confidant and sounding board, someone who can provide a psychological lift and help see the light during challenging times. They have your overall best interests in mind and therefore can be particularly helpful for setting priorities in very serious scenarios, such as achieving work-life balance and not losing sight on your personal values. Number five is the reverse mentor, perhaps one of the most interesting, because these mentors are often a mentor's mentee. Pay attention to the people you are mentoring. Even though they may have fewer years and they may be younger than you in your workplace, they may have some valuable insight to provide to you. They can provide feedback on your leadership style to engage with the younger generation and to keep perspectives fresh and relevant. And finally, we have the Cheshire Cat. This is a concept that I came up with and it's called the Cheshire Cat. For those of you who are familiar with the story of Alice in Wonderland, if you remember, she comes to a fork in the road at one point and she looks up to a tree, in a tree by the road and notices a Cheshire Cat and asks him, which road should I take? And the Cheshire Cat says, well, where are you going? And Alice says, I don't know. And finally, the Cheshire Cat responds, well, then any road will get you there. And I bring this up because I think one of the roles of the mentor is actually to ask more questions than provide immediate advice, to be a good listener. In fact, often when a mentee comes to my office and presents to me with a problem, I don't provide an immediate answer, even if I know it. My initial response is, tell me more because I want them to go through the process of thinking through not only the problem itself, but potential, some potential solutions. And I find in some scenarios, this is a great way to begin the developing process of maturing into their own roles as a potential mentor and solving their own problems, even though it may be challenging. Well, let's shift gears a little bit and talk about how to develop mentors. A couple of tips here, number one, Mentors need clear expectations of their roles and enhanced listening and feedback skills. Most educators and people are not born with mentoring skills and they would benefit from some formal institutional staff development programs to hone those skills so that they can be the best they can be as mentors. Number two, mentors need awareness of culture and gender issues. Mentor mentee matching by gender and culture should not be mandatory but still be available for those who desire it. Alternatively, I would suggest that relationships across cultures and gender can promote more acceptance of differences and lowering biases on both the mentee and the mentor's behalf. Tip number three, mentors need to support their mentees, but also challenge them. Effective mentor-protege relationships should balance three elements, support, challenge, all within the context of the vision of the protege's future. The balance is that if mentors are too supportive without challenging the mentees, for example, always giving them direct answers, then the mentors don't grow professionally. However, challenging without supporting causes mentees to regress in their professional development. So there's a balance between how much support and when to be given and when challenge may be more important. Tip number four, mentors need to be aware of boundaries. They should stick to mentoring, respect personal boundaries in their mentee relationship, including recognizing psychosocial problems that need referral to other professionals and specialists, such as psychologists or counselors, especially when it involves matters outside the mentor's area of expertise. Mentors should avoid mentoring only for their own personal or professional benefit. Do not ever force mentees to follow the mentor's professional career. Tip number five, mentors also need mentoring. The mentor of mentors, the coach. Because no matter how well trained people are, few can sustain their best performance on their own. Everybody needs constructive criticism in the right environment. And that's where a coach comes in. Tip number six, mentors need recognition. 
it's important for the department to raise the value of mentoring. The primary motivation for mentorship should not be for financial gain, but because it is a rewarding aspect of a professional career. Nonetheless, institutional leaders should publicly recognize mentors as an elite group of faculty who are highly valued and appreciated for the work they do. Tip number seven, peer mentoring is an interesting concept that goes beyond the classic dyadic model. It involves establishing a pyramidal model of mentoring where the mentees are at the bottom, and then you have a hierarchical progression, a team of experienced advisors from relatively young all the way to the more advanced and more experienced. What this does is provide some advantages to the mentee. Easier availability of mentees along this hierarchy, greater understanding of day-to-day -day problems related to work stress or conflicts perceived by the mentee, early recognition of serious emotional problems. Mentees may be more open to sharing problems as well with peers lower in the pyramid than with senior faculty high in the pyramid who they might find intimidating for certain problems. It's also important to remember that despite the perception of the value of a mentor, they can be harmful to a mentee. If a mentor insists that the mentee becomes a clone and can only work within the mentor's research area or publish with the mentor, then that can be harmful. If the mentor doesn't provide sufficient time for the mentoring relationship or adequate encouragement for the mentee, that can also not be productive. And if the mentor does not support a mentee from leaving their current role or institution when appropriate, for example, when the relationship is no longer productive, that's important. Mentors eventually need to let go and allow their mentees to gain independence in order to mature their mentee's career. But there are also rewards for a mentor. Formal mentoring rewards include being given time and or funding. The mentor has the benefit of assisting the next generation, which is a gratifying altruistic reward. They should have grat get gratitude from helping the next generation of leaders. And they can receive assistance from mentees to help advance the mentor's productivity and career and can contribute to the mentor's legacy and professional immortality. Finally, I think it's important to remember in terms of rewards of mentorship, that mentoring is not just a responsibility. It's an extraordinary honor. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Prof. Shunan, for delivering that message to us. Our next speaker is Dr. Juliet Hull, who's a consultant and aesthetist currently working in the NHS England. Dr. Hull has a keen interest in global anesthesia and healthcare management and is a mentor in the WFSA's Global Anesthesia Mentorship Program. Dr. Hull has been in the working group to develop and deliver the WFSA Mentorship Program, and I now invite her to present her work on this important program to us. Thank you, Dr. Hull. Thank you very much, Susan, just bringing up. That's it. So happy World Anesthesia Day, everybody. Um, and good evening, good afternoon. And, and for some of you, it might be good morning too. I'm very grateful um, for the opportunity um, to share with you um, information about the new WFSA mentorship program. And reflecting on what Prof Sherman's talk was about, um, it's certainly mentorship is very important for workforce well-being, and I, and I think Mary as well alluded to that. So how did we, how did the WFSA mentorship program start? Well, it all started when a few anaesthetists during COVID times, um, sorry, I'm just trying to, uh, sat down to discuss how we could support um, colleagues around the world when COVID was coming and we knew that there wouldn't be international travel so there wouldn't be medical missions educational courses and that the connections that we made as a group of anaesthetists um, and 
with other anesthesiologists and provided mentoring would be sort of put on hold. So we sat around and we thought, how can we how can people connect globally from different countries um, and mentor each other without international travel? And so our objective was to build a platform for global online mentorship. And we sort of thought, what better place was it than to build it on the WFSA um, at the WFSA, and that's with thanks to uh, Dr. Wayne Morris, ex-president, who was part of the preliminary conversation. We knew that once we had an online membership program, we would be able to develop the anaesthetic workforce. We would be able to keep building on international relationships, and hopefully we would be able to share cross-country best practices of anaesthesia. We would be able to provide engagement in the specialty and in retention in the specialty as well. We knew that would provide uh, increased well-being, but particularly for people in some parts um, of the world, uh, support isolated anesthesiologists. And Mary's talked about that being a problem um, in African countries when you can be one of very few anesthetists um, anesthesiologists within a department. But overall, the aim would be that this would overall increase patient care and patient safety. So we set up an internal development team and it has taken over a few years uh, for the programme to be fully created. And I will give a lot of thanks to uh, the WFSA secretary the efforts of um, um, President Daniela, Francis, Christina, the CEO, Maria, and all the hard work that's gone in to setting up this programme, which we launched um, in early 2024. It was launched via social media, LinkedIn, WFSA, and newsletters, and word of mouth. And I suspect it's new to some of you on the webinar tonight. So I'm advertising it to you as well. We had over 300 colleagues apply, and we started the formal mentorship in June 2024 after a kickoff webinar. Of the mentors, um, applied, we had 145 mentors apply, and we had that them from 41 different countries uh, that spoke English, Spanish, and French who applied. And I think the spectrum of who applied to be mentors was really by advertise the program and I'm um, and um, some in the United Kingdom and I, I certainly did a bit of um, advertising in the UK myself and the WFSA is based in the UK to try um, so why we've got a bit of a, a mix in in countries um, but I think with the program going forward what we'd like to see is a bit more balance uh, talking about the mentees, we had 169 people that felt they would benefit from having a mentor. They came from 50 different countries and again divided into English speaking, Spanish and French. Um, and again, the spread is interesting to look at. Um, and I think over the, the, the subsequent um, pro programs, we can... Um, increase awareness about this project, this program to people. So people applied um, with CVs and applications through the website um, at, back in early, um, early part of this year. Um, and a team of four people, myself, um, the secretariat and the membership, uh, a consultant in charge of membership, uh, Lu Dr. Lewis Falcone, looked at people's CVs and application forms. We looked at matching people through demographics, specialism, individual requirements. We looked at years of practice. We looked at countries. We looked at, um, at interests as well. And we tried to do the matching as best we could based on, on reading through the CVs and seeing what people wanted help with um, and support with. So it was all personally done. It wasn't done through a matching system and we did our best that we could do. Mentors and mentees were then introduced by email. And then after the kickoff webinar, we have um, really 
allowed uh, the mentors and mentees to develop a relationship between themselves that is not facilitated by or led what I should say by the WFSA so every individual match will have a different relationship with different aims and ambitions um, and all that we have suggested is that mentees and mentors meet um, at least fortnightly or a month um, and that the program will we would expect the program to run for a year um, but we were not advising on what people should be mentored about or what people um, mentees should receive um, knowledge about. It's very much a personal relationship that you navigate with your mentor and mentee yourself. So very self-directed. Ideally, we hope that it's being led by the mentees. Um, the current situation is we have about 100 people that have been uh, mentees that have been matched. Um, so sadly, not everyone could be matched. And there was a criteria for application. Um, and hopefully when the program runs next year, we can really look at uh, making sure that people, um, the correct people apply or, or the paperwork relevant to the application is submitted. Um, it is the first program that we're running, so there is going to be a lot of feedback that we need to uh, take on board and change. Already, we've had some positive feedback um, from a mentor with mentee who've already managed to publish together. So that's fantastic news. Um, and we've, we're very pleased to hear about that. But at the moment, it's been the summer recess. So we've allowed people to develop these relationships without you know, bombarding them with, tell us about your, your mentoring relationship. We're letting these relationships nurture. And at, towards the end of the program is when we'll be looking for feedback. The first year, the first year mentorship program, we will be sort of closing up around 2020, July 2025. We're going to be supporting mentors and mentees with newsletters. But like I say, the program is very um, self-directed. We'll be reviewing the feedback which we receive at the end of the program and adjust um, the matches based on feedback and opinions we get. And people that have taken part in the program will receive a certificate of completion of a mentoring or mentoring program. We'll open applications in the summer of 2025 and we'll hope to move into year two by autumn 2025. Um, we hope that this program will continue to grow year on year and grow from strength and strength. We hope that it is a way of the WFSA providing a, a platform to support and improve the well-being of global anesthesiologists. And as from Professor Sherman's talk, you can see that mentoring is a really useful thing to have in your career and in your personal life. Um, it's something uh, that some that if you haven't had and you have and you have the opportunity to have a mentor, it will help you grow from strength to strength. And I certainly have had a personal mentor and it has really helped me enhance my career um, and the way the way I work. So we hope the project will grow. I hope that if you haven't heard about it, that you will share information about it with your colleagues. Please um, feel free to go on to the WFSA website um, to have a look at the, the questions and answers and how it works. And also you feel free to um, email Maria, who's been fantastic at setting up the program at the WFSA. Um, and that's her email address there. Um, happy to take questions at the end. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Hull. That was very a useful run through of what's happening with the WPSA program. Um, so we've had a few questions in the chat about the logistics of it, which you actually answered with your last few slides in that the program for this year is running and will be reviewed and there will be an opportunity to join the program 
for next year um, and that opportunity will be for those I assume that you'll take a look at those who were unsuccessful this year and being matched and they may have some degree of priority but it will be an open program from next year um, and so uh, the question that I wanted to ask um, firstly uh, Prof Shunan, he, um, you alluded in your talk, Prof, to um, a structured mentorship program. I know myself, when I looked to learn about mentoring, I went and learnt, did some education with the social workers who were ahead of the game um, on this. And there was a three-day course I was able to do as a mentor for training. And the mentees also, as they became uh, trainees in social work did a three-day course to learn about how to be mentees and that prepared everybody for the program so I'm curious to know whether you're aware of any sort of structured mentorship program within anesthesia that you've been involved in and following from that once you've completed that question um, I was wanting to know from Juliet whether there's any intention to put structured program support around the WFSA mentorship program. We've had questions in the chat about whether such a thing exists. So we'll start with you, Prof, and then Juliet, if you follow um, with an answer about the WFSA perspective on that question. Thanks, Prof. Sure. Well, well, thank you again for inviting me to speak this meeting. This is this is phenomenal, and it's truly an honor. So we <clears throat> have a a structured mentorship program, even within our department. We have a vice chair of faculty development whose role is not only to enable uh, interactions between faculty and residents, but also to develop faculty into wanting to become mentors, both within the department and through the Harvard uh, University system, where there are formal courses that our department will subsidize both in time and money um, for people who want to pursue um, either part of or their entire career as, as mentors. In addition to that, there are mentorship programs in um, mo many of the societies in which I'm involved with. There's the Society of Cardiovascular Anesthesiologists, which is people think is centered in the United States, but it's an international organization uh, that has its own mentoring program, more for mentors and mentees rather than developing mentors. Um, and then there's a newly established um, International Academy of Cardiac Anesthesiologists that's truly a, um, a, a collaboration of most of the larger societies of cardiac and cardiothoracic anesthesia throughout the world that I strongly believe will also begin um, formalizing a mentor-mentee relationship for, for members. But um, I most of the people I in, interact with are really enjoy being mentors. And I would think again, that either within your department or certainly within most of the major academic societies throughout the world, that there are these, this opportunity to, to uh, interact either as a mentor towards a mentee or vice versa. And I'm happy, you know, um, you can, you can distribute my email to anyone you want and I'm happy to help anyone either directly or indirectly um, uh, with, with any questions I have after this session. Thanks, Prof. Juliet? I think that it's a, a very good suggestion. And I think it's something that we need to look at and see if we can develop the program into, can we do structured um, education for people to become mentors? Um, and uh, having looked at a lot of the applications, People were looking for mentors. Mentees were looking for mentors to become mentors. So what they wanted to be mentor, menteed on was how to become mentors. Um, so I did see a lot of that. So I think there's definitely a need. Um, I'll get back to you when I've spoken to the Secretariat. Perfect. Thanks very much. Mary, um, I was just wondering if you could perhaps comment um, in your um, experience about what sort of mentor level of mentoring um, exists. You mentioned the safe courses as an opportunity to link people up. I'm I'm thinking there may be advantages um, to finding mentors close to home perhaps. Um, and I just wondered whether you would comment perhaps on your perspective of the the mentoring process. Uh, thank you very much. Well the 
mentorship that happens on the safe courses is not structured, uh, but it is built within, because when the safe courses first started, uh, you had international faculty coming out to teach on the course. And the idea was they had to build capacity uh, among the local providers. And so you had an international faculty <clears throat> that was paired or had a number of people that they worked with, local faculty, and they sort of groomed them and watched how they give talks. And, you know, they had informal conversations on the side and relationships developed in this way. And so a lot of the mentorship that's happening, even now that we don't have a lot of international faculty coming um, or going out to teach on safe courses, is we've now built a team of uh, safe, safe instructors uh, in Africa. Uh, a lot of them senior, but they all continue this because then you have to, uh, to build the younger people as they come through. So teach them or watch how they interact with, with the participants and um, give them tips here and there. And sometimes it might stop at the safe course, uh, but sometimes it goes beyond. So it's very informal. It's not, it's not structured, but we've definitely, we've definitely used these opportunities um, to continue relationships with a lot of uh, anesthesia providers in our countries and mostly the non-physician anesthesia providers. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mary. So we've had some comments in the chat about the access for people where you don't have a national society. So I'd just like to reiterate that the process for application for WFSA exists, but also the opportunity to reach out to WFSA directly with this mentorship opportunity is there, as Juliet referred to. There's also been comment in the chat about our diversity globally. So the language we use at the moment, we use English and have spread into French and Spanish, but obviously there's a need to expand into other languages to facilitate the sort of learning and collaboration that we're describing tonight. And the um, opportunity to recognize some of the language we use in terms of our seasons, our time zones, et cetera. Um, we are a diverse, group of colleagues around the world globally and this really is an opportunity to learn and share from each other so I'd like to conclude the webinar tonight we're just at time by asking each of our speakers to share with us perhaps the next small thing that they are working on they intend to do for well-being when I'm asked what I can do about my well-being by my colleagues or um, by the organization I say what is the next small thing that seems feasible with respect to well-being for yourself for your colleagues for your organization or for well-being globally and do that so I'd like to hear from each of the three speakers and um, we'll start with Mary then Prof then Juliet please share with us the next small thing you see as feasible for well-being that you're working on from now. Thanks very much. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, the people that know me are going to laugh at this, but I'm constantly trying to sleep, to get more sleep. <laughs> I can never get quite enough sleep. But I think the other thing that I'm really thinking about, uh, mostly because of a conversation I had with one of our former student, now a colleague, is the res our trainees really deal with so much and I think we're just going to have to start by talking more about this and just recognizing how big it is thank you thanks Mary Prof well it's it's an interesting question uh, I grew up in an environment where wellness was not a concept it was not only not a concept it was considered a weakness that you um you you live to work and not worked to live. And I think one of the things I began doing, and it's been most beneficial to me, is pertains to one of the slides I had in my lecture, which is to get a coach, get someone who can see beyond 
the walls I've built up over 65 years and help me actually identify um, what makes me happy, which um, I've, I'm pleased to tell you goes above and beyond just what I do as an anesthesiologist. So I would encourage people to listen. Listen to your family, listen to your friends, listen to your colleagues, and if necessary, get a professional to, to help you help yourself. Thanks very much, Prof. And you, Juliet? Um, for me, I think uh, I've, I've been I, I've been reading a, a very good book on um, mentorship. I like books on mentorship in the workplace. Um, and it's about listening. I thought I did active listening, but I, it turns out my thought of what active listening is, is trying to fix everybody's problems rather than actually listen to them and make them feel heard which is probably more beneficial to people at the times when people feel stressed and have burnout and have, struggling with their well is that they don't need someone else to come along I'll do this do that do this and from the kindness of my heart I try and come up with solutions for them but actually they just want it, someone to listen to them um, and empathize with them so Active listening isn't quite what I thought active listening was. So now I'm going to go forth and actually genuinely listen, but not try and fix other people's problems. Um, let them but empathize with them and make them feel heard. And hopefully that will support their well-being more. Thank you, Juliet. And I'd just like to share this the next small thing that I try to do for well-being. Um, which is moved towards distress when I see it. I have a sense that we need to treat our colleagues and ourselves with the same sense of care and compassion that we apply to our patients. And so when we see distress, it is a reasonable and safe thing for us to move towards that distress and ask the person we're observing if they're a colleague, if they're a family member, if they're a friend, if they're okay and whether we can be of assistance to them in this moment, human to human. So that's the small um, well-being move that I'm working on and encourage you to do. It is a safe thing to do to ask someone and to just quietly wait and listen to the answer. So thank you. Um, we'll conclude the webinar. I'd like to again thank all of our speakers, our translators, Adriana, Marta, Nabile and Hisham for their help with the webinar tonight. I'd like to thank all our speakers and translators through the year and thank you, the audience, for attending this webinar. And once again, happy World Anesthesia Day, yesterday for us here in New Zealand, but today for the rest of most of the rest of the world. Um, we'll see you at World Congress of Anesthesia 2026 in Marrakesh. And I look forward to your work, your ongoing work for wellbeing. Thanks very much.